I'm head of archaeological collections at the Museum of London. And actually, I'm, having said that, I'm in a really good place. Uh, I do have staff. I do, uh, do have an institution that's accepting archaeological archives. Uh, uh, we've got funding in place from various sources, not as much as we used to have. Uh, so I won't say we're all right, but I can see, see, see the future, and I have a lot of sympathy for some of the uh, some of the talks that we've, uh, some of the observations we've heard today. Um, yeah, that's what the archaeological archive looks like at the Museum of London. <laughs> um, yeah, Indiana Jones was mentioned this morning. Uh, we've had HLF money spent on us, uh, um, opened in 2003, two, two, two. Um, uh, we have moved forward from 2002 in quite a steady and methodical fashion in terms of uh, curation, access, research, and hopefully being a role model for others. Now, <clears throat> I've got a new... Um, management regime at the Museum of London who called for a review of the LARC last year, which I carried out and made a series of recommendations and a lot like uh, Gail, I can't reveal to you what they are, but suffice to say my recommendations went into the yawning more and nothing came out until yesterday afternoon when I challenged my new line manager, what are we going to do about this? Why haven't we made any progression? Because basically I want, there's things I want to do. And he said, we haven't done anything because it's too big. His actual phrase, we've not done anything because it's a head fuck. <laughs> Shh, that gets edited out of the video. <laughs> it's all right. I'm just saying what I heard yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where we come from, the London Museum, uh, the Guildhall Museum, we have this antiquarian past, we have this pedigree, uh, we have the great advantage of the Second World War, uh, which cleared a lot of sites, <laughs> with thanks to the Luftwaffe. Um, there were things that happened in the 40s and 50s and 60s, which are the antecedents of the Museum of London and MOLA, so we have this long pedigree of uh, to go back and we can stitch a lot of things together. Uh, we got to the 80s and it started to look like that. Uh, this is the this is where we where we start look, looking for the money to to put it right. Um, a colleague of mine actually found there were 320 320 different size boxes in the uh, the archaeological archive. Some of my favourite being the rat poison boxes. <laughs> Um, well, we're ten p each. Who wouldn't buy them? <laughs> um, HLF money put us into a good position, which also sorted out our colleagues in uh, MOLA in terms of their office provision, which has gone down a little since then. Um, rival of uh, roller racking, um, uh, reboxing, putting things into only three different size boxes. Uh, the content of the boxes matches the size of the boxes. The bags uh, talk to the size of the, the box. The, uh, the stuff on the shelves fit nicely. There's just enough room to get your fingers around. So we're saving space all the time. Um, apparently, we are the Guinness, in the Guinness Book, Book of Records as the world's largest archaeological archive. I think that's because they haven't find, found the real one. <laughs> uh, my colleague Dan is very, obviously very proud of this. We have our oversized objects in an aircraft, in a rotting aircraft hangar in, in Wiltshire, uh, courtesy of the Science Museum uh, in Rawton. And it's uh, our oversized objects, not just from archaeology, but from the rest of the collections. Uh, you touched on visitor numbers. I'm afraid this is where a lot of the visitor numbers may be. Um, there's 1,300 uh, research visits between 2009 and 2013, although it is a bit skewed by the English ceramic circle, who would come in every week and go, oh, saucers, cups, saucers, cups. Um, uh, and that's a mixture of people looking at records and finds. 
we do a lot of activities around the archaeology in terms of uh, learning uh, community engagement I mean you've, you must have seen these photographs before the the big dig uh, were highly active courtesy of the Arts Council for England in shopping centres where people uh, have uh, engaged with our local archaeology people who don't come into central London so we'll go out to Bromley or Croydon or whatever uh, hang around obviously next to Waterstones and tell them about it uh, families in early years learning as well school kids uh, we even had a little foray into music, dance, and comedy last year. Uh, that's when we got seven people trapped in the lift and I had to call the fire brigade. That was a really good night out. <laughs> and I, I'm personally quite interested in uh, art and archaeology. And, I've, and I believe in that people come along and say, I want to do some quite zany things with your collections and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. You can do whatever you like with your collections and use them for an inspiration but you always have uh, a zero line a point that you can return to which is the archaeological archive this is an effect this is an interpretation of an archaeological material done by Jeremy Della and the Venice Biennale using our stuff and he can juxtapose it, juxtaposition it with a giant mural of a hen harrier or a crushed range rover or whatever but we come back to a point which is our original records. That is not how it does it, it is. Anyway, I wanted to, just to postulate a few possible scenarios and outcomes which have stemmed from the, mm. the, the review that I mentioned that mm. I can't say the word that comes after it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so we could do nothing. We could just go ahead as the way we are and keep on collecting, keep on push it into the spaces and then we'll be back to the position we were in before the investment in the, the archive by HLF and others. Apparently um, Simon Thurley, who was then the director of the Museum of London, said to John Shepherd, my predecessor, if, it's a re if it really works out well, it's my idea. And if it's a failure, it's yours, John. Uh, so we had containers in the car park stuffed full of human remains articles in the Guardian saying relics might have to be reburied we just go back to that position some of you may feel that you're already there um, you've heard of all about uh, the, the, the semantics of the language used but uh, there are things that we are doing at the moment about in effect, compressing our collections. That if you get your volunteers to repackage, uh, reform, you can claw back between 10 and 15 percent in terms of space. There's also the the, the well-being that people uh, can gain from volunteering and learning about their past and uh, interacting with other people. Um, our colleagues in MOLA have uh, have done some interesting pieces of work about. Uh, uh, not retaining things, uh, in fact, not even deaccessioning because it doesn't even get to that point. Uh, recent pieces, of, um, I'm thinking about Walbrook. Yeah. You know, if if you'd spent all your money that you could have spent on the animal bone from mm. Walbrook, we would have a pile of animal bone the size of a, a slag heap and no way into it. So there's some very focused and clever thinking has gone on about. Uh, retention on a site-specific level. I um, uh, did a piece of work with uh, a kiln site from Kingston, which was to put aside the non-diagnostic non sherds, record them, count them, but not retain them. And that that um, gained us a square meter, no, two square meters at the time, cubic meters. I beg your pardon. So there's. And then there's all those conversations that we all need to have about rationalizing con uh, collections, how to weed them, how to uh, take the brick and tile out that can be recorded in a more methodical fashion, how we can look at uh, um, animal bone, whether it's associated with um, residual pottery, much like what has occurred at Walbrook, and focus on particular animal bones. Every time I have that conversation, there will be a person who says, what about the future techniques? What about the things that haven't been invented yet? 
what about the pig DNA, handheld pig DNA app? Where are you going to have that? <laughs> I can't see into the future. We can see into the past. Um, I think we have to be brave and we have to make some of these decisions and I think we have to acknowledge that some things that we might do might be wrong with the benefit of hindsight, but I think we just have to get a bit of spine and do it sometimes. Um, and of course, there's, there's, there's the deposition by surrogacy, you know, by, by record, by uh, digital means. Uh, then there are other people who are cherry picking. There are some museums who think we, you know, and some museums are quite object centric. I mean, we in this room, we like the context thing. Um, he is a cherry picker going on at the moment. Uh, picking his way through the portable antiquity scheme, waiting for the next election. Um, I don't believe that's the right thing to do. I think that's wrong. I think that the, the uh, your square end brooches that you were talking about this morning, that's, that, you know, just, just homing in on those special things is wrong. I do something in the archaeological archive. And by the way, I don't know how many boxes I've got. I've got 11 kilometers of linear shelves where I should take people around and I challenge them to pick a box at random. I don't tell them where to go. And then I'll talk about the contents of that box regardless of the content. And I think you can say something about everything. Anyway, I think some of the things that I'm... This is the slide I got to where I was just can't find the pictures to go with it, but I was just, just going to uh, say some of, the, some of the words, some of the, the <coughs> provocations for you. Is, uh, is about collecting policies. Uh, I sit on the Museum of London's uh, Collections Committee and this is this monthly beauty parade where new acquisitions are brought to us and curators make a case why it should be part of the museum's collection. This is across all of the material types except archaeology. <coughs> So the costume curator will go, well, look, this is a 1936 wedding dress made by Una G. F. Smilson, who was worn by her and, her and her daughter and her granddaughter, and here's the documentary evidence that goes with it. And there's a conversation goes on about the context of acquisition. I think there has to be a little bit more of a conversation about archaeology acquisitions. Uh, um, Surrogate de deposition. I think somebody said this morning that can't find their way through the, the pot shirts because everybody describes them in a different way. Our advantage in London is there is an established way of describing pottery by fa fabric, form, and decoration. And I think maybe we need to look at uh, data sets. We don't need all of the shirts. Uh, and I I've had a lot of anxiety because, of course, we set ourselves up to be a digital depository and we can't do it. We, frankly, we can't do it because we can't get the staff, we don't pay enough, and I'm not sufficiently confident in the server capacity of the institution to be able to continue. So I think ADS has to be the route that a lot of us will need to take. Uh, deeds of transfer, where controlled as a museum that's validated by the Museums Association that we have to have a deed of transfer for everything in our collection. We have to be able to demonstrate that we own everything or have an agreement in place as a substitute for that. The material that we've got from archaeology is one, was once compared a, akin to pieces of wool stuck on barbed wire fences. It's, it's technically, it belongs to the farmer but he doesn't want it. Uh, so I think there's a conversation that we as a sector have to have with the uh, Museums Association and also about disposal as well. So it is a fairly convoluted method, as Duncan alluded to this morning, to deaccession material from museums. In fact, it's easier to get stuff into museums than it is to get, out, get it out of the museums. Um, It'll have to go, it has to go in the museum's journal. It has to be offered to other museums first. 
oh, by the way, we've got a crate full of Roman building time tiles with no edges on. Does anybody else want it? <laughs> there's a chance that if we don't want it, nobody else wants it. So maybe there's, there's some there's ways of getting around this that we have to investigate and uh, deep store on uh, I don't necessarily mean the company in Cheshire. I think there is something that we have to think about whether there are places on a regional basis that all of the archaeological material goes to which may allow us to as museums draw on it or even contractors or universities or whoever has a vested interest in it. And I'd just like to draw you at, um, attention to a conversation that happened in Parliament in 2007 at the time the MP Robert Key, MP for Wessex, was chair of Wessex Archaeology and he asked the uh, Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport about what discussions he's had with English Heritage on the creation of regional depositories of archaeological archives and material from excavations, to which the Right Honourable David Lammy, then um, Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, DCMS, has not had any discussions with English Heritage on the creation of regional depositories for archaeological archives and material from excavation, although officials have had some discussion, the mu Museums, Libraries and Archives Council, which of course has now gone into the uh, Quango bonfire, <laughs> but some of its roles have been uh, absorbed by the Arts Council for England, is the government's lead advisory body on archives policy, so nothing came of that. So that's about it from me in terms of provocation. Thank <laughs> you.